major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. It's a great day to be a Padres fan. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. The Padres won their home opener against the San Francisco Giants this afternoon. Final score, 6-4. to four. KPBS reporter Melissa May is live at Petco Park. Melissa. Happy home opener, Maya. The energy here at Petco Park has been electric all day. Before today's game, I had a chance to speak with some of the Friar Faithful and even Padres new manager Peter Schilt, M excuse me, Mike Schilt, and everyone is excited for this 2024 season. Of course, this will be the first season without the Padres manager, beloved, without the Padres beloved owner, Peter Seidler, but it's pretty obvious that his legacy will live on throughout this ballpark, throughout this organization, and he will always be a San Diego Padre. The Padres played in front of a sold out crowd for their 2024 home opener. Lucy Dixon and her family came all the way from Alabama to experience her first opening day. My favorite part so far is just seeing all of the fans because everybody's so happy and festive. Let's go, Padres! San Isidro residents Vicento and Carla Martinez have high expectations for the Padres this year. All the way, the championship. We need that World Series ring. We need we that parade. Yes, <laughs> we're ready. Padres manager Mike Schilt says home openers are always special. It's a one loud stadium. This might be the loudest stadium in the league um, and the passion just comes through so it's a special place to play. We're excited. San Diego Padres president of baseball operations and general manager AJ Preller says the team is fired up and grew out his mustache for opening day. Obviously you know Peter Seidler you know just a kind of celebration and just you know more of a tribute to him so a bunch of us front office throughout the organization Trevor Hoffman mentioned it at the uh, at the ceremony on Saturday that um, you know just kind of as a tribute to Peter. Hey let's do this for Peter. He wanted us to get a championship let's get it for him. Seidler who died in November was honored throughout Echo Park, from his initials and a heart on the players' uniforms, on the field, in the dugout, and on the screens throughout the stadium. You know, I can feel his presence here today. He's clearly with us um, in spirit and memory, and, and um, you know, we're going to honor him today, of course, and he'll be in our hearts all season. Said Maya, it's a great day to be a Padres fan, but it's really a great day to be a San Diego sports fan as the Padres opened up Gallagher Square to host an SDSU men's basketball watch party. The Aztecs are taking on the Yukon Huskies in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. And as you can see, these fans are still going strong. Live from Petco Park, Melissa May, KPBS News. And we have more Padres coverage, including a special episode of KPBS Midday Edition focusing on opening day memories. You can listen at kpbs.org and all podcast platforms. Now, across the Bay in Coronado, a protest demanding a stop to the ongoing sewage contamination of South Bay beaches and water. The rally of support to protect the coastline was organized by students from local high schools. And KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez joins us now live from Coronado's Central Beach. M.G. Why do we Maya, the controversy over toxic sewage coming in from Mexico has been going on for decades, but today we heard from the younger generation. These are the folks who will be most impacted by the continued toxic sewage that has been littering our coastline. They are here this afternoon to protest, to rally, and to demand action. Joining us now is Sean Wilbur, who is a sophomore at Coronado High School. He is also vice president of the Stop the Sewage Club. Now, Sean, you all started this club last summer. Why? What's the mission? Yeah, we wanted to uh, create this club so 
that we could call our government to action because we noticed how this impacted our community, our sea life, and the tourists around here. And so we wanted to empower our students to solve this crisis. Whose attention are you trying to get, Sean? We're trying to get the attention of all federal government officials because they are the ones that have the power to allocate the funding necessary to fix the uh, detrimental infrastructure down there and solve this crisis for all of us. So those those are the people we want to get their attention. Sean Wilbur, Vice President of the Stop the Sewage Club at Coronado High School. Thank you, Sean, for being with us this afternoon. There's the voice of the younger generation determined to do something and motivate adults to get the problem solved. Live in Coronado Beach, I'm M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Maya, back to you. I'm Ariella Scalise, and coming up tonight, we are tracking a Pacific storm that's going to bring big impacts by the time we head into the weekend when it comes to any kind of travel or outdoor plans. Tonight, we'll start to see areas of low clouds, the wind pick up at ahead of this next system, and then we'll start to see some moderate to even heavy precips and mountain snow. I'll let you know when things dry out and clear up and start to warm up. That's all coming up. An update today in the sexual assault lawsuit against former San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. A judge ordered Fletcher's accuser, Garcia Figueroa, to preserve all potential evidence on her electronic devices. KPBS's Amitha Sharma says Figueroa is looking for a new lawyer, her third one on the case. Nathan Fletcher's lawyer, Sean McCaveney, is seeking to recover messages between Figueroa and Fletcher that he says were flirtatious. He also wants Figueroa to turn over messages between her and her friends. He claims the communications will exonerate Fletcher of sexual harassment. He also says Figueroa is either deleting or concealing them. Plaintiff has acknowledged in sworn discovery that she recorded her messages with Mr. Fletcher. And as of the date of that recording, there are certain messages visible in the recording. She later admitted to unsending these messages. Figueroa isn't giving interviews. Her former attorney says she never admitted destroying evidence in the case. Figueroa herself promised to abide by the judge's temporary restraining order against removing messages from her phone. He asked her why she hadn't turned over messages from her friend as part of discovery. Because uh, the documents are with communications with my friend and counselor, so I need to uh, see, because I think that those, docu uh, those communications are privileged, so we have to go through that. Fletcher's lawyer was skeptical. This is a friend that she's traveled to Peru with, that she's got a pool parties with. The judge has given Figueroa time to find a new attorney. She parted ways with her second set of lawyers last week. She declined to state why, other than to say they separated amicably. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. A warning to our viewers, this next story includes a discussion of suicide. A rising number of high school students have seriously considered suicide, according to CDC data. And this week, KPBS is looking at mental health in schools. Reporter Katie Heisen says students facing higher risk LGBTQ plus youth also face higher barriers to get help. More than one in five high school students have seriously considered suicide. For LGBTQ plus students, that number rises to almost half. Some of the statistics are really staggering, and fr frankly, we have a crisis. That's Walter Phillips, CEO of San Diego Youth Services. The nonprofit's contract providing student mental health services was terminated by the Grossmont Union School Board after community members objected that they also provide services for the county's LGBTQ plus youth. It was part of a string of actions affecting LGBTQ plus students like banning safe space posters and pride flags that several school districts surrounding San Diego took this year. Phillips says those actions have big consequences. The more we put up barriers for these students to feel like they're um, in a safe place, um, then that increases their mental health issues. Moxie Childs, now a high school junior in Temecula, says he's experienced that firsthand. During 2021, which was height of the pandemic, um, I was in and out of mental hospitals quite a bit. I think I was in and out about three times for trying to kill myself. Um, I was not 
happy at all. I was isolated from my friend group when I went to Catholic school because I came out as gay and trans. Um, and there's a lot of isolation that goes on for a lot of queer kids in Temecula and the surrounding areas. A Temecula Valley Unified School District spokesperson said they had no comment on the details of the story. Their school board voted in August to notify parents if their child shows signs of being transgender, like asking to use a different name, pronouns, or bathroom at school. The next morning in school, it was somber. There were a few people crying, um, having panic attacks because they, their parents couldn't find out. Moxie says it's less of an issue for him. Most people at the admin don't even know my legal name because it's not in any of the documents at all, which I really appreciate. Um, some students got a hold of it at one point and that wasn't fun. But it was a big problem for a lot of his friends, he says, who were outed to unsupportive parents. There are several students who've been put in danger with that. We have a few students who are being kicked out of their house because of that. He says it pushed this part of their identity underground. Nobody really comes out to the school anymore. Um, there are specific teachers who will know and just not say anything, say it's a nickname, that sort of thing. A month later, the district banned all flags, except the state and U.S. flags, unless they have superintendent approval. However, the only teachers that received warnings for that were teachers who had pride flags up or had the, you are safe here or hate has no place here. In response, Moxie handed out pride flags on sticks. People were taking them to try to rip them up, which that part was a little bit funny because they were actually kind of plasticky instead of fabric, and they couldn't rip them, <laughs> which was really funny because they would just struggle for a bit in the brick stick that they were on. <laughs> LGBTQ plus students are harassed for their identity at higher rates than straight students, CDC data show. And that number is rising in recent years. But the school district's actions, Moxie says, make LGBTQ plus students afraid to use the school's mental health services. And it's hard to be open and it took a while for me to accept myself. Um, it takes a while for anyone to accept themselves, but especially in a setting like um, how Tobacco Hill is right now, where that sort of thing is being shunned and ostracized and punished, it gets a lot harder. So instead, he says, they create their own support system. We just kind of rely on each other instead. Of, that works a lot better. All of the kids he knows who were kicked out are now in homes. Some back with their parents, others with new guardians. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. If you or someone you know are having thoughts of suicide, you can call the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. I'm William Brangham. Tonight on the News Hour, the disgraced cryptocurrency mogul Sam Bankman Freed is sentenced to prison. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Vice President Kamala Harris announced new mandates aimed at preventing government use of artificial intelligence in discriminatory ways, including at the airport. Ivan Rodriguez has more on the protections and what they mean for TSA screenings. Don't feel comfortable using the facial recognition technology at airports? No problem. That's the message from the Biden administration as it rolls out new safeguards to protect Americans from government abuse of artificial intelligence. When it comes to anything regarding personal data, there is definite worry that that information is being used elsewhere. Under the requirements, which take effect December 1st, travelers should be able to refuse facial recognition scans at airport security without worrying they'll be delayed or lose their place in line. There is going to be a good portion of people that are breathing a sigh of relief, knowing that they don't have to opt in to anything regarding personal data um, when it comes to their travel experience. Some travelers seem unconcerned and say AI is already the norm. We're already using it for our phones consistently. I mean, just about everybody's doing it. But there's evidence that using AI tools like facial recognition can lead to discrimination something the Biden administration is also working to prevent in government agencies. There have been numerous studies that demonstrate that facial recognition is less accurate with the faces of people of color. The new mandates are designed to cover a range of scenarios, from TSA screenings at airports to decisions by other agencies, which affect Americans' health care, employment, and housing. I think the real problem here for safety advocates who are concerned about the use of technology is that there are some areas where a lot of experts feel it's not 
appropriate to use artificial intelligence at all. In Atlanta, I'm Ivan Rodriguez. San Diego State is back in the Sweet 16, and right now they're facing off against the Yukon Huskies in Boston. And KPBS reporter Alexander Wynn is live at Viejas Arena where students are watching the game. Alex. Hey, that's right, Maya. Today is a great day to be a sports fan here in San Diego. The Padres won earlier today, and the Aztecs are hoping for the same. Now, um, obviously, I'm representing the Aztecs with my gear on. The doors opened about an hour ago to let fans in. About 5,000 fans are expected here today. Now, it, this is a ticketed event, so if you don't have a ticket, uh, you won't be able to get in. Now, San Diego State, this is their first time on back-to-back -back Sweet 16. They're facing a familiar foe, UConn. And one student we talked to earlier today uh, said it's time for some sweet revenge. I'm very excited. I mean, Sweet 16 uh, was pretty good. We went to the finals last year, and um, we're hoping that we can get farther than we did last time. Um, so it should be a pretty sweet revenge. And now, if you remember last year, UConn beat the Aztecs in the championship game. Now, many of the same players are back this year, so it's pretty much the same matchup and a rematch of last year's game. Um, right now, the current score is, uh, give me one second, 33-28 uh, with the Huskies leading, but there's still a lot of basketball left. Uh, so live at the Vijas Arena, I'm Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. Well, I wish I had some better news to bring. Our forecast takes a turn kind of for the worse by the time we head through the end of the week and into the weekend as we track this approaching Pacific storm. Ahead of that, the winds picking up throughout the mountains and the deserts. And then it's this weekend that we're expecting some areas of moderate to even heavy rain. Could have some thunderstorms that move through in the mountain snow. We will get drier and warmer, though, as we head into early next week. I think tonight is mainly dry across San Diego County, Borrego Springs 49, Mount Laguna 35. Areas of low clouds start to increase tonight in San Diego as temperatures drop to the lower 50s. Tomorrow, we'll still see sunshine moving on through, but the winds again kicking in. Look at Mount Laguna, only 42 degrees, Borrego Springs 73, but Oceanside, Chula Vista, San Diego, your temperatures will top out into the mid-60s tomorrow. Heading into the day on Saturday, there's this Pacific storm that we're tracking. All the moisture starts to move into SoCal here. We're going to watch some areas of showers throughout San Diego. It's going to be some rough surf, so surfers beware. Anyone who may be traveling for the weekend, Easter holiday weekend, travel disruptions are expected because of the wet weather moving throughout the state. The storm does linger as we head into the day on Sunday. I think that's where we could even have some heavier rain around San Diego with those brief downpours. Could start to see some ponding on the roadways, and the wind will still be gusty as we track this storm through Sunday. So there it is, a bit of a weekend washout. Saturday and Sunday, pouring rain along the coast on Saturday. Rain and some thunderstorms as we head into the day on Sunday. And then we'll see sunshine and warmer temperatures returning by early next week. Similar forecasts as you move further inland where rain and even thunderstorms possible as we head into the weekend. Temperatures only into the 50s. By Monday and Tuesday, though, we'll start to see temperatures climbing. Tuesday back to the 70s. Big improvements as we head into next week. The mountain forecast, boy, is it going to be windy as we head into the day on Friday. And then windy concerns here with some icy conditions as we head into Saturday night. And then we'll be watching the snow on Sunday before we start to see improvements next week. We wrap it up in the deserts where it's going to be cloudy on Saturday, but areas of rain move through on Sunday. For KPBS News, I'm Ariella Scalise. That glass of wine that you love so much may not have as much time left as you might think. Scientists say 90% of the world's wine-growing regions may have to close up shop by the end of the century due to climate change. A new review published in Nature Review's Earth and Environment says more drought and heat waves may have great production make make great production impossible. Southern California is one of the regions that is impacted. There's a new centenarian in San Diego, but this 100-year-old is not a person. It's a place. Downtown's Balboa Theater opened 100 years ago today, and KPBS reporter John Carroll has a look at its history and the big celebrations planned starting tonight. When the Balboa Theater opened on the southwest corner of 4th and E Streets, it was, as the San Diego History Center describes it, a well-designed combination stage and screen house from the era of palatial theaters. 1,500 seats, a stage the size of most Broadway stages, and something quite unique. 
Live waterfalls on either side of the proscenium arch with a distinctly western landscape. I feel like the Balboa is San Diego's jewel. Abigail Buell is with San Diego Theaters. The nonprofit runs both the Balboa and downtown's Civic Theater. It is the epicenter of all kinds of arts, performing arts within San Diego. The epicenter, no longer a spring chicken, needs plenty of attention. Theatrical TLC. And we are constantly doing upkeep and little things have changed, but you know, in preparation for its 100 years, we are working on some new carpet, which we'll see all over the building um, that was custom made and designed by us. Carpet bearing capital B's, surrounded by a rope design, a nod to San Diego's maritime heritage. The exterior has a fresh look, a new tritone paint scheme and more. Pole banners, awnings, things to make it feel a little bit more refreshed, um, digital screens, things that will allow us to, you know, promote what's going on inside the theater to the public and everyone around. And so really excited about all of that. That excitement reaches a fever pitch beginning tonight. A gala celebration kicks off a weekend of special events. Playwright, pianist, and actor Hershey Felder will present a tribute to an era of music known collectively as the Great American Songbook. Then, tomorrow night at 7, a screening of the 1929 silent movie The Flying Fleet, with accompaniment on the Balboa's amazing organ. More on that in a moment. Saturday morning, the focus is on the little ones, a children's costume parade where all children are encouraged to come in their best Roaring Twenties attire, followed by tunes and tunes, classic cartoons with the organ providing the musical background. Everything winds up Saturday evening with San Diego Spotlight that will feature several local performing arts groups. Making the Balboa more accessible to San Diego's many arts organizations is a priority. So from tonight through Saturday, all of the money from ticket sales will go to the Balboa Theater Grant Fund. Which offers to subsidize partially or fully local arts nonprofits here in San Diego to ensure that they can use our space so that they can really focus on their art and being on stage and we can do the background work, right? Operations, ensuring that labor costs are covered and things like that. A big part of this weekend's festivities is what you're hearing now. That is the sound of one of the finest theater pipe organs left in the United States. Originally built for one of the Lowe's Grand Theaters in and around New York City, the Wonder Morton Pipe Organ made its way to the Balboa in 2009. It will be played on Friday and Saturday by visiting theater organist Ken Double. This is a fabulous pipe organ. The Morton Company understood this would be their signature instrument. The organ is a marvel of early 20th century engineering. One of the people who plays it, helps to maintain it, and knows it best is Russ Peck. This complement of pipework is, in my mind, one of the greatest designs then and now. We talk to Peck up in what's called the foundation chamber. High above the stage, it's where the hundreds of pipes and other instruments live. Whether he's up here fixing this or adjusting that, Peck is in his happy place. It's so special, and the um, and it makes me feel really happy just being around it. That's how it makes me feel. Back downstairs with Ken Double at the console, and he's treating us to a preview of the special theme music he wrote to accompany the flying fleet. Our job is to enhance the movie, to make the music affect the film, without getting in the way of the film. We're, we're the best thing, the best compliment we ever get. Oh my God, I forgot you were even there. We know we've done our job if that's what we hear from the audience. All of this, the organ, the theater in its newly refreshed state, this weekend's big celebration almost didn't happen because in 1959, the theater was slated for demolition. It was to make way for a parking lot. But the Russo family bought it and kept it as a movie theater for the next couple of decades. The city bought it in 1985, but it wasn't until 2005 that a major $26.5 million renovation took place, including earthquake retrofitting. It reopened in 2008 when San Diego theaters took over operation. 
As the Balboa Theater becomes a centenarian, it is definitely time to celebrate its big birthday. But it's also a time to reflect on how incredibly fortunate, how lucky we all are that this gem of San Diego is still here 100 years later. From the Balboa Theater, John Carroll, KPBS News. And if you liked this story, you could check out our Spring Arts Guide. There you will find our picks for the best art and culture in San Diego, including visual art, theater, dance, music, and literature, and even some picks for kids. Just go to kpbs.org. And here is a look at what we are working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. The city of Berkeley is repealing its ban on natural gas hookups in new homes to comply with a court ruling. NPR's Morning Edition will discuss the potential impacts for other cities that have tried to pass similar rules. And KPBS Roundtable is hosting newsroom leaders from local colleges for a discussion on student journalism. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.